afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to many of you. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time, I'm Maggie Mahan, the Assistant Director for Community Engagement with the State Historical Society of Missouri. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon as the Associate Director of the Cape Girardeau Research Center, Bill Edelman, presents the ninth installment in his beginning genealogy workshop series. Today's program will focus on finding your ancestors in newspapers. If you need to catch up on previous installments of this series or would like to rewatch any of the segments, you can view them on demand on the State Historical Society of Missouri's website at shsmo.org. All events in our virtual programming series are made possible thanks to the generous support of the State Historical Society of Missouri's members and donors. You can visit our website to learn more and see how you can add or renew your support. Thank you again for joining us and now I will turn things over to Bill. Thank you Maggie. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, back for this uh, latest installment of the Basic Genealogy series. Uh, one of the things I hope I've made clear through these presentations is that you can't find everything online. And over the next three of these sessions, uh, we're going to gradually get to where you can't find any of it online uh, for the most part. Uh, and today we're still, there's still a lot of things online, but there's a lot that isn't. And that is newspapers. Newspapers is something that uh, when, if you started genealogy like I did 30 years ago, you were kind of lucky if you had a small sampling of newspapers on microfilm for a given location, and you might have to go to that location's library to actually find the microfilm, or to a place like the State Historical Society of Missouri that microfilmed uh, large numbers of newspapers. And uh, just to remind people, State Historical Society of Missouri has the largest collection of Missouri newspapers in existence. There are equivalent sites for many other states as well. First of all, a little bit about newspapers. Newspapers are something that didn't exist always because obviously printing didn't exist. Uh, I, be, I kind of wonder nowadays if newspapers will continue to exist. Maybe they will in a digital format over time, but it's kind of a shame because those digital versions tend to not have the detail that the print versions used to have. The first one of these was uh, a weekly news sheet that was uh, appeared in Venice, Italy around 1566. The first printed newspapers though were not until the printing press was invented and those appeared weekly in Germany in 1509. It was heavily censored. Obviously the German states were ruled by princes and dukes and similar uh, nobility, and so you didn't say anything bad about the powers that be or the way they did things. So there was a heavy hand of censorship. The English uh, did the same thing initially, but then they relaxed censorship in 1695, and newspapers really started to flourish in uh, England at that time. The first American newspaper, public occurrences, both foreign and domestic, appeared in Boston in 1690. You notice that's five years before censorship was relaxed. It came out with one issue and apparently said the wrong things, and so the, the authorities suppressed it. That was it. But by 1704, the Boston Newsletter Weekly appeared and was a little bit more lasting. The Pennsylvania Evening Post in 1783 was the first American daily newspaper. Most of them were weekly or monthly prior to that. By the 1830s, the illustration shows a what, what is the classic letter press, printing press. By 1830s, there were high speed presses, which obviously made it a lot easier to uh, print large numbers of newspapers and also lowered the cost of newspapers. Before that, newspapers might be passed around quite a bit uh, between neighbors or uh, acquaintances. What do we find in newspapers? Actually, you can find quite a lot if you're lucky to find the right newspaper and the right article. 
So first of all, what a lot of us are going for is vital records, births, deaths, marriages, and divorces. And uh, the only thing is, in newspapers, these are not limited to fixed fields. So you don't know exactly what you're going to find for details. You might find biographical details, either an actual biography in some cases, or obituaries are the most common biographies that appear in newspapers. You might find legal notices that uh, provide some of the same information if you know how to read between the lines. These are things like name changes, probate, court cases, bankruptcies, and the ever popular, uh, my wife has left the, uh, my, my abode and uh, I am not responsible for any debts she incurs. That's the, you know, the juicy stuff that uh, if you find that about an ancestor, you got more things to look for. You'll find out employment and occupations, either if somebody, say, died on the job or uh, their occupation is listed as part of the article. And so you may have no idea before you actually see it in a newspaper. Addresses. And addresses, even in cities, are a uh, relatively recent phenomenon, not, not until the late 19th century, really, in uh, uh, most cities and small towns. And uh, so looking for an address might be a little tricky before that, but you will find people's addresses listed once they had an address. Also, don't just restrict yourself to the things about your ancestor. You're going to get context in newspapers. What was happening that day or uh, during that season? What special events might have been going on? Uh, did your ancestor attend one of these special events? And as, as it mentioned in the paper, immigration and emigration. Sometimes in coastal cities like New Orleans, it may list that a boat came in and uh, it was from Ireland and how many people were in the boat. Very rarely, you might have a list of passengers. Also, when someone died, it might in their obituary say the the a deceased was born in this town in Germany. And you may find that no other place. You may not even find it in your ship's passenger list or the naturalization record. Newspapers are excellent routes to other research directions. Maybe your ancestor is mentioned as a survivor of their relative's decease and it will list what city they're in, and that will point you to another location to research. So be aware of things like that. It's not just the main things you're looking for in a newspaper article. It's a lot of the context and the background information. A little bit of a caution, when, when we look at digital newspapers nowadays, and more and more of them are being digitized, although the majority still are not digitized, you are going to be dealing with uh, computer programs that fall under the category of OCR. That usually is interpreted as optical character recognition. The computer recognizes certain letters and uh, translates them and puts them can put them into an index, but it's also called optic optical character reader as well. This is the electronic conversion of images of text to machine encoded text. Typically you have typed or printed text, but it's possible to go from some handwritten text. This will really probably be one of the next big revolutions in genealogy when we can train computers to uh, recognize handwritten text uh, in all of its variability. This has really revolutionized many areas of genealogy in terms of finding some types of information. When I first started uh, looking at newspapers, Usually I would need the date of an event and would start looking in the newspaper issues page by page around that date. Uh, if I were lucky, someone might have abstracted things and you would then be able to go and uh, write to the issue. But that was kind of rare. Uh, newspaper abstracts were a, a rare thing. There are limitations though to OCR. Condition of originals and image quality varies. Look at this one. It's got uh, either the paper deteriorated or a, some critter ate 
a piece of it right there where it should be notice. It's just note. Uh, there's also a mark across it. Who knows what that mark was? It could have been a fold in the paper. It could have been a, an ink stain from somebody writing on top of the newspaper. You'll also have the perpetual problem of words being broken across lines and hyphenated, in which case it won't pick them up. Uh, Edelman's real bad for that. It's a long name and it might be E-D-D-L-E -E hyphen next line M-A-N. And if I look for Edelman, I'm not going to pick that one up. It won't recognize that. It won't recognize the hyphenated word. Some surnames are unfortunately the same as places or things. If you have, are unfortunate enough to have a Park ancestor uh, and you look for Park in newspapers, wow, a very small percentage of those might actually be surnames. The same with Marsh, uh, many others, Fields, um, all sorts of names that actually are also proper nouns other than a person's name. Some fonts are tougher to OCR than others. Uh, somehow they've broken some of the old German uh, fonts that are in uh, German language newspapers and are able to OCR some of those, but then there are others where they haven't. It's just a matter of time before they do. In what form might you find newspapers? Well, we're depending on the newspaper, it may not exist anymore. It may have been destroyed. People didn't think about, hey, my newspaper is going out of business. I should save one issue and put it in a library. Uh, your newspaper went out of business. You may have just thrown everything away or the next person would have. So it may be no longer in existence. Every so often, a newspaper will pop up that we didn't know existed. We, well, we know the newspaper existed, but we didn't know that it survived. Um, and Or they may not be in any archive. They may be in a physical form, either bound or archived to the library, and that's it. May go no farther than that. You start to get luckier if they have been microfilmed. And uh, we're kind of at an interesting point with microfilm now. Um, they've stopped manufacturing a lot of the readers for microfilm because they figure it's, oh, it's obsolete technology. The only thing is it's still the most efficient way to keep a lot of things for several hundred years short of actual writing on paper. So uh, microfilm may be in the local library of the site where the newspaper was published. It may be at a state level somewhere. It may be in a state library or a state archives. You just have to look and I'll give you a hint on, on how to look later. If you're really lucky, they're digitized either at a free site or a subscription site. They may be digitized at multiple sites. Also, uh, there may be books of transcriptions, abstracts, or indices in your uh, local library or genealogical library. You may really luck out, and there may not only be transcriptions, abstracts, or indices, but they may be on a website. So uh, particularly look at these local level gen websites that are still out there and the roots websites that are still out there, a lot of times they'll have newspaper abstracts. They may be of limited duration and in, in time, but it's something. Now in terms of looking for newspapers and finding them and the different outlets you're going to find them, uh, you, you recognize this as a painting by, of the Tower of Babel. And we all know what happened with the, the parable in the Tower of Babel. Uh, the Lord confused these, these people that were building a tower, intending to get to heaven with the tower. And they, the Lord gave them all these different languages, and they could no longer communicate with each other. Well, it's the same way with newspapers. Uh, for my own local county here, I have to go to at least half a dozen places to find what's been digitized and microfilmed. It's not all in one place. And it's hard sometimes to figure out where it is. So I'm gonna give you a few free places to look first. And one of this one is a really remarkable site, the Ancestor Hunt. Um, and you've got the, the link in your handout as well. This is really incredible. 
It lists all available online newspapers by geographic locations with links to them or a list of subscription sites that have them. And they this is updated relatively frequently. The only thing is it is a uh, non-commercial site, so they have to pay for it somehow. So there's a lot of pop-up ads and you have to minimize those or X out of the pop-up ads. And so it can get to be a little irritating, but compare that with having to do a lot of long distance traveling and it uh, it's better. So here's what the, the main page looks like. There is a newspaper links that you'll wanna check out to find your location. And then it's categorized by state. So I clicked on Missouri and it discusses kind of in general um, how to access Missouri newspapers, nothing real specific and some statistics on Missouri newspapers. And here we have just a, a sampling of newspapers from Missouri on the Chronicling America site that I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, these newspapers are available on Chronicling America, which is free. It's the Library of Congress. Then I can go down, I can drill down to the county and Grundy County Library. All of these newspapers are available there for Grundy County, Missouri. So this, you'll get lost in this site, a warning. Don't expect to get in and out of it quickly because there's a whole lot of layers to go through that are really interesting. So that's uh, one gateway to a lot of uh, free digital newspapers across the country. Let's look at some of the sites that do digital newspapers for free. And uh, I'm going to talk about some of these. I won't talk about others, but particularly look down at the bottom. There are a lot of them that are state specific and you're gonna be able to ac access these through Ancestor Hunt or even Wikipedia has a list of online newspaper archives. These links all should be in your handout. But I'm gonna talk about Chronicling America, uh, a subset of that, which is the Library of Congress, US newspaper directory, uh, State Historical Society of Missouri, and along with that newspapers.com and uh, Google newspapers. So I'm gonna talk about each of those, some of the pluses and minuses and actually how you're gonna be able to navigate them. First of all, the Library of Congress, bless their hearts. This has been, this is really the, the oldest digital newspaper site and it's still free. Uh, your tax dollars are at work in this case. And uh, when you get to loc.com, uh, you'll see this. Up at the top, there'll be a block for state two blocks to define a, a year range. So if you know when your ancestor was alive and active, you'll wanna restrict that down. And then um, you can enter search words. And again, we talked about Boolean logic and, and searches on the internet and all of those things can be used. The, the quotation marks for a string, uh, and just individual words. Uh, I'll just give an example where it's a surname. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to restrict it down to Missouri and I'm going to leave the range because I know there were no Fulbrights in Missouri before 1820-ish or 1810. Uh, and then I'm gonna search for the surname Fulbright with one L. Uh, you also search with two Ls if you're gonna really do this search for that surname. And so I'm gonna, and then you, you uh, click go and I end up with five results from Missouri. It doesn't mean there's not more, it just means that they're not digitized on the Library of Congress Chronicling America site. So one of them was kind of interesting. It was like, oh my, I think I knew this one before. It's not my line of Fulbrights, but uh, I kind of collect things on Fulbrights. Um, this was a Fulbright who was originally from Greene County, Missouri, who was fatally wounded in Arkansas. So even though I searched for Missouri, it picked this up. Um, 
in the state journal in Jefferson City and Fulbright was murdered in Arkansas. So uh, it also mentions that he was a brother of Samuel Fulbright. And you can see how this just keeps building on each other with an article like this. Uh, it also mentions another brother, Ephraim Fulbright. And I'm sure if I went through this with a fine tooth comb, I'd get all sorts of clues on this family. I probably also ought to mention when you're citing the source for a newspaper article, this is a good format to use. The title of the article, the newspaper name, where it was published in parentheses, the date, the page number, and it's also helpful to list the column number. And then a semicolon and where you accessed it if it was a digital online uh, access. So in this case, Chronicling America, and it's actually a gov site, sorry, but not a com site, it's a government website. And then the day you accessed it, why do you put the day you accessed a website? Uh, because it may change, it may go away, it may alter in some way. And uh, that way you've at least restricted it to, hey, it was here on that day and I saw it, uh, it may be different now. Right, I'm gonna go in uh, to the uh, Chronicling America site and do an advanced search and search for newspapers. Uh, you can do it this way as well. Uh, well, sorry, back up. This is another way to do it if you want to do a more thorough job and do an advanced search. This is another way to do it. Also, you can click in this advanced search page, you have a US newspaper directory. The Library of Congress as the repository for just about everything printed in the US has a directory of newspapers that are known to have existed. They may no longer exist. Uh, they may have been published for quite some time, but there are only scattered issues available, but it's all listed in this U US newspaper directory. Very handy. So I just did Cape Girardeau County, which of course is my home county. And uh, my gosh, over the course of time, there have been at least 29 different newspapers published. The first one I believe started in 1819, and it doesn't seem to be listed on here. So this is not absolutely a definitive list, but uh, it's going to list most of them. And I want to just show you what, uh, if I click on these, what it looks like. And I'm going to select a newspaper called the Southeast Radical, which was published in 1865 to 66. And in those days, Radical would have probably referred to Radical Republican. Uh, these were people who were abolitionists, uh, uh, promoted a real uh, harsh reconstruction attitude. And so I can understand why this only lasted a year in Cape Girardeau County. So here it is, Southeast Radical. Um, it was published in Cape, Cape Girardeau. And the publishers were J.G. Copeland and H. Brule. It was only published for actually not even a year. And it began 1865, ceased 1866. It's a weekly in English. And the description is based on the one surviving issue, which actually has been digitized and is available in one of the subscription sites. So you can also view complete holdings, not just in the Library of Congress, but libraries that have it. So in this case, the sole issue is available in the American Antiquarian Society newspaper project in Massachusetts, but they have allowed it to be digitized. Well, that's uh, looking for newspapers that may have existed. And you can go back to your ancestors site or always look in surrounding counties as well, because over the length of time that a lot of these newspapers were published, many of them were published for short times. There may not have been a newspaper in your county, but there may have been one in the neighboring county that was used for legal notices 
in uh, many other uses and news. All right, the one that's closest to my heart is the State Historical Society of Missouri's collections. And first of all, I'll talk a bit about microfilm. We have, if it's not available any other way, it's available in microfilm. Uh, unless it's a very recent issue of something and then it might only be available as hard copy. And you can browse these in different ways by county, by town. Uh, there's an online catalog, but I'm just gonna click on county, Gentry County. And we get a Albany in Gentry County had the Albany Capitol published 1890 to 1957. And we do have it on microfilm and the real number is given in that column. And so the first issue available is on reel 130. So you can go request that if you're doing research at the State Historical Society, or you can request it at one of the branches of the State Historical Society around the state, and it will be sent to the one closest to you for you to research. But by far the most exciting part of our holdings now is the digital newspaper project. And we have partnered uh, using uh, newspapers digitized under library services and technology grants. We have partnered with Ancestry via newspapers.com to make these available for free. Yes, you heard me right. A lot of people I hear complain, well, I can't get on it because it's on newspapers.com and I don't want to buy a subscription. Well, if it's certain Missouri newspapers, you can access it through our website for free. This includes materials three years after they first appeared in Ancestry outside LSTA grants. So in other words, predating our LSTA grants and partnership. They're only accessible at research centers uh, initially, but after three years, you can even access them from home just by going on our website. Uh, at that time, a new access page is gonna be created after the three years. So right now you can pretty much access a lot of Missouri newspapers through our website. As I say, it's not really the back door, it's more like uh, an alternative front door. The current grant, uh, or at least this was true uh, early this year, we are working on 10 counties uh, right now, selected newspapers. So for access instructions, you have to use this link every single time you wanna access it. You have to bookmark that link. If you bookmark the title you're interested in, it is going to revert back to subscription and be inaccessible. You would have to re, uh, you know, go back out of the site and come back in. Okay, you can browse a list of titles and click on the title to access an individual newspaper. If in the course of your searching, the SHSMO, State Historical Society of Missouri logo is uh, not visible, you're back to notfreenewspapers.com. Uh, you're not going to access anything for free. So you have to make sure that logo is visible. Then use the search box under the title or browse by date under the logo. And I'll, I'm gonna work through an example. If it's needed, use the help button. Uh, I will say that not every question you could come up with is gonna be handled by the help button but some of the principal problems people run into are. So here we go, we get on our website. Uh, when you do research, you can click on newspapers and then uh, click on digital access, or you can go through the digital resources links and then click view digital newspapers. Here is a list of all the digital newspapers we have. If you wanna access the weekly Citizen Democrat from Poplar Bluff in Butler County, you would click on that. And there it is. And then I can search and you notice the logo is up at the top. So I'm, I'm free so far. You can search for 
a surname or a, a string of text, and then you can limit it down by browse date. And that's done by years. So the Weekly Citizen Democrat was published from 1908 to 1938. And I'm, the example I'm going to work through is a family, uh, the Henricks family, who were kind of prominent in Cape Girardeau briefly. And then uh, one of the sons, Charles, moved to Poplar Bluff and was actually quite prominent in Poplar Bluff and uh, other places in Butler County. I actually met his son back in the 70s, who was a very interesting character. And so there's the Citizen Democrat, and there's all the hits I got with Henrik's. But the one I was really interested in, and I kind of looked for 1910, and I found the one I was actually interested in, which is Charles Henrik's uh, obituary. There it is. Okay, that's what I was trying to find. So how do I save this? If this were newspapers.com, you just highlight it, clip it, uh, save it as either JPEG or a, a PDF, and it would be part of your subscription. But in this case, because you're accessing via the State Historical Society website, you would want to go, uh, or you have to go set up a free account to do clippings. Set this up with your email, make up a password, write it down or you know, save it in your password uh, saver, and uh, you'll use it again if you ever need to do another clip. So I'm not gonna do that here. Uh, just know that you have to set up a little free account in order to save things. So that's just a real brief run through on how to do that through the State Historical Society website. Um, if you know a newspaper has been digitized and it's not available through there, you're going to have to find a library with newspapers.com or purchase your own subscription. And if it's other states, definitely have to purchase your own subscription or use it in a library. <clears throat> Another place to go to get digital. Uh, newspapers are state level websites. And I'm just going to work through the Missouri Archives website. Most states have something like this. So you can check with your own state library, state archives, or state uh, historic uh, society. And uh, Missouri's a lot of times overlaps with what's digitized elsewhere. And because of the nature of the platform, the Digital Heritage Initiative uses in the state archives. Uh, if you have an alternative for a newspaper, I'd go to us or newspapers.com because this is really, this platform is kind of a pain to use. So what I'm gonna do is just show you one that is a very interesting newspaper, the Cape Girardeau Weekly Argus. The reason I say it's interesting is it picked up during the middle of the Civil War, it started. Uh, the newspaper that had been in Cape Girardeau before that had a very strong secessionist leaning. And so the Union Army basically kind of threw the guy out of town. And uh, for a while, they continued to publish his newspaper, uh, the Cape Girardeau Eagle. But then the soldiers, the, the soldiers that were doing it got transferred elsewhere. And so they stopped doing that. And this guy picked up, unfortunately, after the Battle of Cape Girardeau, so there's nothing in the local newspapers about it because there was no local newspaper. We knew this newspaper existed because of things like legal notices and probate files and elsewhere, but we did not have it. A few years ago, a gentleman communicated with the city and said, I have a, a near complete set of the Cape Girardeau Weekly Argus. I would like to sell it. I will sell it at a discount to uh, a local entity. So Southeast Missouri State agreed to take it. They didn't have any money. So the Center for Regional History and the Genealogical Society bought it at a much reduced price. And that, don't, that uh, guy that sold it is, we're forever in his debt. Very interesting newspaper. And it was then digitized with a grant from the State Archives. 
So it's available here. It's also available via uh, special collections and archives at Kent Library in Southeast Missouri State. So there's, I clicked on that and there's every issue picks up in June of 1863. If it had picked up two months earlier, it would cover the Battle of Cape Girardeau. I'm just gonna click on the first issue, page one, and that's what it looks like. So this is an example of one that is only available digit in digital format here. That's it, State Archives website. Another one that's free and is very exasperating, but uh, has a lot of newspapers and nobody else has, is the Google News Archive. Google was starting to scan and digitize newspapers at one point, and they were not too careful from what I understand about copyrights. And so there was a threat of a lawsuit. So they just stopped in at one point, just one day stopped digitizing. But everything is still up online that they digitized. So there are a number of newspapers that are only available digitally through this outlet. And it is exasperating. There's the link, which is in your handout. Uh, and they stopped adding content in 2011. It has a search feature, but it is basically worthless. I've tried searching and it's it picks up all sorts of things that are interestingly bizarre. So uh, I stopped using the search feature. The way I use it is I use it to find events that I have an approximate date for and then search the newspapers in the location around that date, which is admittedly not a great way to search, but if you uh, want an obituary for somebody's death date you already know, uh, which is the example I'm gonna use, it's, it can be pretty valuable. There's also no way to clip. So you have to uh, center the news article or do it in pieces and use your print screen key to uh, copy it. And then I do a little editing and uh, cropping to get rid of extraneous material. So the first thing you're gonna get when you go to the main website is just an alphabetical list of papers and you can search it. The search engine here works on this one, but not for, for content in the papers. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look for my grandfather's obituary, which strangely enough, no one had saved um, that I know about. Um, and so it was in the Cape Girardeau, Southeast Missouri. So I'm gonna click on that. And what you're gonna get is a you know, newspaper that was published for a great long time, you're gonna get it divided into decades. He died in 1950, so 1950s, and he died, uh, I think it was February 28th, 1950. So they're not going to immediately get an obit in the paper, although I've been surprised before. Evening papers might have an obit for somebody that died that morning, back when newspapers were very efficient. Uh, and so I'm going to search March 1st and see if it's there. And here's March 1st. And yeah, it's there. And there's my grandfather's obituary. And so I uh, went through, had to do print screen three different times to get different pieces of it. And uh, then uh, put it all together in a file. I, I usually dump these into a Word file and uh, there's the citation. It's, it's full of a lot of detail if you don't know the family already too, and it's got a nice little biography as well. Help me to put some dates on things and a little bit of context as well. All right, so that's an overview of some of the main free sites. What about subscription sites? These are going to vary in geographic coverage to some extent. Some specialize in certain parts of the world or certain states. 
all have at least some unique newspapers, which means all of these potentially have something you can use. I wish it were all in one spot, but that's just the way it worked out. There's some overlap. Some are limited to newspapers and others have other record types in addition to newspapers. Before you subscribe to any of these, check with your local library or check with the library you might visit frequently or be able to visit. The premier one, as I mentioned, is newspapers.com. Includes 20,100 newspapers, probably more since I copied this down, uh, over 632 million pages and increasing all the time. There are two different levels of subscription, a basic and an extra. It is a subsidiary of Ancestry.com. So you, when you do a search on Ancestry, just a general search for a name, uh, you may get links in newspapers.com that pop up. You can search it using keywords or strings. You can browse by locations, paper, city, and you can search individual newspapers. So it's a pretty robust search within the limits of OCR. Clippings can be saved as JPEGs or PDF and can be appended to your ancestry family tree or downloaded. It's pretty intuitive and relatively user-friendly. Uh, so I, I find myself using it a lot. Another one is Genealogy Bank, it has some newspapers. A large percentage of the newspapers that they have are unique to them larger than some of the other uh, multi-purpose subscription sites. When I use it, it's a little slow and I don't necessarily like the search tool. It is also more difficult to save clippings than newspapers.com. My backup, if, if all else fails, is I use print screen for a lot of these things. It has a lot of older newspapers. Uh, a higher, high proportion of the relatively new ones are actually just obituaries. They've just pulled out obituaries. It is restricted to the US. My Heritage is another multi-purpose uh, um, subscription site. It also does DNA. And they are predominantly um, have a lot of Australian newspapers and the ones that are in chronicling America. There are some niche collections though, if you have a Quaker ancestor, Quakers were generally highly literate uh, and kept good records. And so Quaker newspapers might be a really good source if you have a Quaker ancestor. And there are also a pretty large number of European newspapers. So again, it just kind of depends if you're already in my heritage because of DNA, <clears throat> you may want to upgrade your membership to access newspapers, or if you have these niche or certain foreign country needs, you may want to go there. Somewhat hard to search, not as flexible as newspapers.com. A relatively recent addition is newspaper archive. I really, I went through this and I had a tough time determining actually what titles were available. They may have improved the site. It's a newer site compared to many of these others. It's really tough to use and there's very little help available. And again, I, I trust they're improving that over time, but they have a very large collection. So think about newspaper archive kind of Check it out at a library if they've got a subscription. They're likely to improve over time. Find My Past is very heavy on British Isles. This is another multi-purpose uh, subscription site that is, again, mostly emphasizes British Isles. But they have more and more news, U.S. newspapers over time. So not much to say about that unless you have relatively recent British immigrant ancestors. A few hints for searches, because a lot of people will do one type of search, quit, think there isn't anything out there and go away. 
But for exact phrases, you can do that in most of the searches on uh, the search engines on these websites. So I'm gonna use George Washington as an example. So George Washington in quotes. But then you gotta remember, uh, you're gonna get a zillion hits with George Washington. So uh, you may wanna restrict it to Mount Vernon, Virginia, and then a date range, his lifetime. Uh, if that doesn't give you much, then cut out the date range. And if you're still not getting much, then cut out the location, just search for the name. And if that still isn't giving you much, just the surname, because you may not get him, you may get somebody else, or you may find out that your ancestor went by his middle name most of the time. Or you can reverse that and build from general searches to more and more specific if you're getting way too many hits with the general. Just kind of depends on your preference, but don't stop with one type of search. If that doesn't work, try searching with the initials, G Washington. I've found more and more that uh, some people went by their initials uh, more than their name. Try varying combinations of surname, location, and time period as well. And I'll tell you one other thing too. Um, try women's married names. So Mrs. Daniel Slocum, not Mary Slocum, that gave me some more hits when I figured that out. Uh, and I'll tell you one other thing, they're adding newspapers all the time. You may find very little and you go back six months later, do the same search and suddenly you're getting hits because they digitized the right newspaper. So don't consider that it's a done deal if you just search once. Also search for other family members. Well, I can't find the ancestor. Let's see if I can find his brother or brothers or his sisters. Also, you can try wild cards if those are allowed. A lot of times asterisks are used in a string. Like if you've got multiple letters that may be in a given gap in a name. So that's uh, the one you see is my default when I'm searching for Edelman because it's spelled so many different ways. If you, there's only one letter, like if you have a Hanson ancestor and you're not sure if it was O-N, E-N or A-N, or it may have been all of those at various times, a question mark in there for one letter. A few hints. Read the entire newspaper. Again, that gives you context, but uh, what was going on the day that this event happened? As you look at a newspaper, if you want to search through, if you have an ancestor in an area that may have appeared in the newspaper a lot, Learn which pages had local news and that'll make your searches more efficient. Typically papers, if they were four pages, they'd have a national, international page, they'd have one or more local pages. Uh, they might have one that would have a serialized story early on, or they might have uh, uh, sports if it's later, classified ads. So uh, learn the page that typically had the local news. Check for birthday or wedding anniversary events at key times. Don't have that marriage record date or marriage date for an ancestor. See if they celebrated their golden or silver wedding anniversary. And you may have it then, even though you don't have the marriage record. Check all newspapers if more than one occurred in a given place. I know at one time in Cape Girardeau, there were four early in the 1900s at one time. One was German language, uh, but there were events that were covered in all of those, and there were events that were only covered in one of those. So check them all. Always transcribe to uh, focus on details. I've discovered things that aren't obvious on just a scan, a skim through an article by transcribing them. And that's true of any record. If the paper is in more than one database, check both in case the OCR varied or in case they were digitizing from a different copy of the same newspaper. Uh, OCR can vary in quality and it can vary with individual 
page of the newspaper from paper to paper. If the paper hasn't been digitized, always check microfilm or hard copy. Too many people I know about, well, it's not digitized, I'm not gonna look. Well, there may be some really good stuff on that microfilm. If you're looking at microfilm, keep in mind, you have to check the whole microfilm. They may not have been microfilmed in date order. They may be out of date order. Look for all news, not just vital records. Your ancestors had interesting lives. They weren't just born, married, and died. They had a life. And you're going to learn more about that life if you look at all the news. You can search the address in addition to the people. Well, who was at that address at different dates? Was it a relative? Was it a friend? Why is a different person there on a given date? Where did my ancestor go? They left in this state between the date they were here and the date somebody else was at the same address. They left. Where are they? Search for parts of names. And that goes back to that hyphen breaks problem. Check thoroughly for burn counties, including papers in adjacent counties. In some burn counties, the newspapers may have survived. They weren't in the courthouse when it burned. Uh, and also, your ancestor may have been mentioned in the adjoining county. It's always a good idea to look in the adjoining counties. Occasionally, you'll see an article like this one about a wedding where it says, Baltimore and Frederick, Maryland papers, please copy. This was a hint to other newspaper editors that there are relatives in your area who might be interested and you might sell some papers if you copy this into your newspaper. You can bet that somebody related to either the bride or the groom lived in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, and this was in the St. Louis paper. Frederick County is next to Baltimore County in Maryland, so that tells me there's more than one group of relatives. Look for articles showing how people lived. Uh, note funeral home and the obituaries. There's more records potentially in that funeral home if you go to local archives or sometimes state archives or to the funeral home if it still exists. Newspaper articles may complement diaries. Okay, you find an event in a diary, look in the newspaper to see if it was covered more thoroughly. It may complement Bible entries and other records. If you have clippings that, heaven forbid, and most people that did this 50 years ago didn't save, oftentimes didn't save the dates in the newspaper name, find a unique text string in that article and search for it, and you may find out where it came from. It's exasperating when you find something like that. Oh, wow, what a neat obituary. Where was it and when was it published? And you have, don't have that. Finally, prepare for surprises. I have a five greats grandfather, James Mundy, who was born in Virginia, uh, spent most of his life in Fayette County, Kentucky, then came to Missouri the last couple of years of his life with tons of property and died in Lincoln County. I had no idea. I knew he owned a lot of slaves and I just figured, well, he had probably had a lot of land and uh, farmed a lot. And lo and behold, when the right newspaper became available in 1813, the reporter in Lexington, Kentucky, he was a regional dealer of fruit trees. Undoubtedly, a lot of the slave labor was used to care for fruit trees, to care for orchards. And so this was just an advertisement in this paper, a list of fruit trees for sale by James Mundy on Elkhorn, which there's a lot of James Mundys. I know this is the right one because I knew he had land on Elkhorn River, half a mile above Bryan's Station. And then it lists all these heritage varieties of apples, some of which still survive today. And he was apparently known for caring and preserving some of these varieties of apples, even in 1813, and pears. So 
I had no idea about that ancestor being a big regional fruit uh, tree dealer until this little ad pops up. Finally, I hope you can find your ancestors in the news and flesh out their lives. Thank you. Thank you.